Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 32nd annual HDSA Convention Research Forum. I'm George Orling from HDSA. We have a great day of science um, for you and a really special presentation, presentations coming up this morning. Um, let's see, our slideshow. So just before we get started, I just want to talk you through our agenda for this morning. Uh, hopefully you guys had a chance uh, this morning while you had breakfast to go out by our uh, uh, registration table and see the two posters from our Don King Research Fellows. Um, if not, uh, we, after our break, we're going to have a 30-minute um, break after our keynote speak, our, uh, speech from uh, Dr. Catano, where you're going to be uh, seeing posters from Danny Berge, from uh, Montana State, formerly Montana State, but working at the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington, and Xu Wan Zhang from the University of Pennsylvania, who's working with Bev Davidson at uh, CHOP, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, our, other, our third Don King Fellow for this past summer, Lance Heady from University of Iowa, couldn't join us this weekend. Um, but I just wanted to take an opportunity to have uh, Zhu Wan and, and Danny stand up. They're in the front here, so look for them at the break. Give them a round of applause. And, you're looking at the next future HG researchers right here. The Don King's Fellowship is one of my favorite programs um, because it gives the opportunity over the summer to give some resources and opportunity to these incredibly talented and bright young kids uh, exposure to the, the world of Huntington's disease research. And uh, this year, I'm very proud to announce that we've expanded our program and awarded four fellowships for 2017. This summer, while they're not here because they're hopefully they're in the lab even on Saturday working hard, uh, we have uh, Kirong Kim from Columbia University working with I Yamamoto, uh, Paul Elizad who's at Catholic University in DC with John working under the mentorship of John Choi, Chris Yannick who's at the University of Central Florida who's actually working and being mentored by one of our HDSA Human Biology Fellows, Amber Southwell, and uh, Ms. Teal Jenkins, who's a first-year medical student at uh, University of Washington Medical School, who's doing some research over the summer at, with John Fox at the University of Wyoming. So hopefully, in LA, these, these four great young scientists will join us and present their work. Um, we're going to hear a presentation in just a minute from Dr. Catano from the University of Milan. We'll have our break, and then it'll be followed by our uh, I'm sure you'll all be looking forward to a, a year in review update from Dr. Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll. Um, but don't leave after that. Stay tuned. Um, we'll, there'll be box lunches being brought into the room. It's a free lunch provided by Teva Pharmaceuticals. We're very uh, thankful for them for providing that. So grab a lunch, sit down, and you're going to hear the latest updates from the currently recruiting clinical trials in the United States. We're going to hear from Jamie Levy from CHGI. will give us an update on Enroll HD. We are really uh, privileged to have Paul Bono, the CEO of Wave Life Sciences, who can talk about allele selective Huntington lowering approach that's about to go into the clinic. We'll hear from Neil Simon, the CEO of Azavan, talking about the STAIR study testing a, a vasopressin 1A receptor antagonist for depression in HD. And finally, I'll close it up with kind of rounding it all together and talking about uh, the HDSA HD trial finder. So I'm going to now call up our chairman of the board, Dr. Eric Johnson, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker and, and uh, have a little special presentation before we turn it over to Dr. Catano. Thanks, George, and good morning to you all, and welcome to a very exciting uh, day here at the 32nd Annual HDSA National Convention. Research Day is amazing because you get to hear about everything that is going on and all the things that are going to be coming down the line very quickly for those of us who are working and living with Huntington's disease. So thank you for being here for this today. Before Dr. Catania begins uh, what will be a very exciting keynote this morning, we wanted to take a moment to recognize her for her outstanding work in HD research. Thank you so much for making the trip uh, to the U.S. during what I know is a very busy time for you, so thank you for being here today. HDSA has had the pleasure of greeting Dr. Catania in Rome at the Hidden No More event with Pope Francis. 
an event that happened in large part because of her stature and influence on behalf of families affected with Huntington's disease. On the heels of that amazing event, amazing global event, it really seems fitting that we are here this morning to talk about HDSA's deep appreciation for scientific leadership. The HDSA Research Award is given to an individual or team who has made a significant contribution to our understanding of Huntington's disease. And today we are honored to present that award to a researcher who has been involved in HD research for more than 20 years. Dr. Elena Catano began her research career at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States after receiving an advanced degree in pharmacy. While at MIT, she studied neural stem cell differentiation in the human brain in the area associated with degenerative diseases like HD. It is from this early work that her passion for stem cell research blossomed. Dr. Catano returned to her native Italy and began work at the University of Milano, where she continued her research as a member of the HDSA Coalition for the Cure. In 2013, Dr. Catania was named the Stem Cell Person of the Year by Dr. Paul Knopfler and his stem cell blog for her work with neural stem cells, and in particular, as they relate to developing new therapies for HD. Dr. Catania is director and founder of the UNISTEM, the Center for Stem Cell Research at the University of Milano. She is also the director of the Laboratory of Stem Cell Biology and Pharmacology of Neurodegenerative Diseases in the Department of Pharmacological Sciences. I hope you don't have to say that all too often because that's a mouthful. Um, notably, she has also achieved the honor of being appointed a Senator for Life by the President of Italy for her distinguished commitment to research. Dr. Catania has been recognized for the many important stands she has taken on key issues over the years among them preventing partisan politics from determining scientific funding decisions in Italy, as well as her battle with deceptive stem cell companies that prey on desperate people by selling untested remedies that they claim are cures. For her outstanding contributions to research and public activism, for her humanity and dedication to HD families everywhere across the globe, we are pleased to present the 2017 HDSA Research Award to Dr. Elena Catania. I want to start with this one. Because uh, I love uh, exploring the unknown and uh, finding uh, answers about the things that uh, we don't know. And as I was preparing this uh, simple slide, I was uh, asking myself, I mean, what is the reason behind? I mean, why do we or I love science so much? And of course, I have my list of reasons, and I want to present some of them to you. Um, I love uh, looking at the history behind any scientific discovery, and I must admit I have a great admiration for uh, the colleagues of the past and uh, for many of my current colleagues that have made uh, their land, uh, landmark discoveries, thanks to the courage that they developed to stand alone for years in a completely unexplored territory. Good reason, I mean, to love science, and there is a lot behind each uh, scientific discovery. There is also a lot of beauty, uh, science, uh, delivers a lot of uh, beautiful images about the things that we study. These are uh, human embryonic stem cells. We can make good neurons from them. 
And uh, there is really a lot of beauty as you see them developing under the microscope and taking over full responsibilities for generating the 250 specialized cell types that compose our tissues. How can they be so powerful? Of course, I mean, I love science uh, because it's uh, full of doubts as we ask uh, ourselves whether what we see is really what it is or whether or what we think it is. I love uh, science because it's uh, full of secrets. And for example, if you think at the stem cells, they are like a pot really full of secrets. And you, I really had the feeling that you just have to open the pot, look inside and discover the magic inside this pot. And uh, I love science uh, because uh, it's full of details. I really love details. You know, sometimes these details uh, can be quite difficult and, uh, you know, science uses a difficult jargon. Scientists can be difficult people, you know, they can have some ego. <laughs> and uh, so, and I really feel that this sometimes becomes a barrier, you know, when we want to deliver to the society and to the citizen and to the politicians, so we have to think I mean, ourselves within the scientific community, how we can remove, I mean, this wall is really a terrible wall. And there is a suggestion. Uh, this is a suggestion for me, for, uh, for the scientists in the room. And the suggestion comes from this beautiful book from Ramon Cajal. Uh, he was an histologist, Nobel laureate, and uh, the, so at some point he says uh, something very uh, special. So he says, um, what a wonderful stimulant it would be for the beginner. So the beginner, let's assume the beginner is someone that doesn't know, okay, what we're doing and the science and the discovery and Huntington and all the other things. So, so as we talk, uh, there is on the other side the beginner. The beginner can be the student, the public, or the politicians, and he says, what a wonderful stimulant it would be for the beginner if his instructor, so the professor, instead of amazing and dismaying him with the sublimity of great past and current achievements, would reveal instead the origin of each scientific discovery, the series of errors and mistakes that preceded it. He says, this would be a skillful pedagogical tactic because it would instill the conviction that the discoverer, along with being an illustrious person of great talent and resolve, of course a genius, some of the scientists are really genius, was in the final analysis a human being, just like everyone else. I really feel that we have to talk about, you know, the courage, the difficulty, and the many failures that accompany every single discovery, because everyone knows about failures. We don't have to deliver just, you know, the final results. We have to talk about the method. So I really think that this is a very important thing uh, to, to keep in mind. And of course, I love science because, you know, we share data, we share results, we really develop a network of uh, colleagues uh, and uh, that really uh, work in different uh, uh, area and the city of the universe. And either they can be in United States, uh, Europe, or Asia. I mean, we really, know, we, we really know how to form a global scientific community, and I really see what that means. And being part of the HDCA coalition, I mean, it was really a, a great experience for me, I mean, in order to understand what it means, I mean, to work together uh, in order to tackle a, 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 single, uh, a single point, a single aspect of uh, our research. And of course, I mean, I love science because, you know, you, you, the world is full of uh, great colleagues, as I was mentioning before. Here are some colleagues working on Parkinson's disease. I mentioned Parkinson's disease because uh, the way they work on uh, with stem cells 
for Parkinson's disease is really uh, uh, inspirational uh, uh, for me. So these are colleagues that uh, have been working together since many years and they are part of different institutions from the world. So, you know, boundaries, countries, mountains, and sea, I mean, for us, is nothing. So, and uh, uh, really, there is a lot of uh, power in, in all of this. So, there are many good reasons for uh, loving science, but uh, I would say that there is one more reason for loving science, and if someone would ask me to describe that reason with a single image, I would use this image. The desert. You have many here in the United States. You are really lucky. I love this image because uh, as for our science, the desert is immense and continuously changing, but uh, essential in its uh, characteristics. And uh, I would say that embedded into this image, so the reason why I love this image is also a sense of freedom to go to have the possibility to go anywhere. So all you have to do is uh, just to build a new road that uh, will take you there step by step, a little farther every time. And uh, there are no borders, no gates to open. Anyone can come in as soon as they have a good idea to put into motion. There are plenty of uh, traces, as you can see here, that you can follow, that were left by those who were there before you. Sometimes it may be easy to follow them, as uh, traces will be very visible. At other times, a blast of wind will scratch them away. And in any case, you cannot be sure that those who were there before you were going into the right direction and uh, you will not be able to know beforehand if your intuition will take you there. This is also a place where you can be very lonely and uh, you may often feel trapped into, in a maze with no clear path. However, this place allows you to explore territories unexplored by others with no constraints on previous tracks, where nothing counts except the evidence and the solidity of the road you will go along. So I use this image also when I teach to my students uh, because I really want them to understand that uh, in whatever desert they will end up being in their future life, they should make sure it is not too populated. You know, because uh, if it is too populated, it means that you are selecti uh, selecting an area of investigation uh, which is, uh, you know, quite usual stuff. And this is uh, really the significance of uh, being a scientist, uh, feeling the fear to stand there alone in a desert in order to develop the courage to explore the unknown for the entire humanity. And sometimes as you turn on yourself 360 degrees, eh, you may see no one, really. I mean, if you pick up the, okay, an unknown, unexplored desert, you should see no one around you. You are a scientist, but you're also a human being. So when you see no one around you, you know, sometimes you are just scared like hell. You may be you, you may be alone because you're just on the wrong track, or you may be alone because, and no one, with no one else around you, simply because you are so much at the frontier that no one else you know, had reached that level of investigation. So at, at that time, you have two options. One is to run away, of course, this is human. The other option that you have is to develop the courage to stay there. And there are many colleagues in this room that I admire a lot because they have developed the courage to stay there alone to investigate Huntington disease for all of us. So, uh, standing there and uh, exploring the unknown. But as we travel, 
as we travel the desert to, con to conquer the unknown, we also have to make sure that our path is not misdirected. I'm very sensitive about this. We have to make sure that there is no political interference. I want that desert to be the land of freedom. I don't want anyone to tell me where I should go, what I should explore. I don't want to have anyone, not a single government, not even a religious influence, telling me that I shouldn't explore that path because, okay, I am a scientist and I, will, I want to have this territory available and free for anyone to explore. And, uh, you know, Italy is a great country with a lot of history, good food, fashion, but it is not a country for scientists. And uh, I have had a lot of personal experience and uh, I spent a lot of my time uh, really reacting, even these days, <laughs> against uh, uh, a political inter uh, interference on uh, uh, research uh, freedom. I really feel that scientists, you know, scientists have received this important mandate from all of you, from citizens. And the mandate is that they have to explore. I mean, no matter what, they never have, they should never bend their heads. They must react every day as sentinels for the entire society. So Italy is a difficult country, and as a consequence, you know, in my life, I happen to sue governments that were trying to take away from me my right to study, for example, human embryonic stem cells. I have reacted against a political distribution of research money. And I've always considered the United States as a model to look at in order to build the capacity and the vision of the importance of the separation between political decisions and scientific discoveries. And you know, and you have plenty of examples of people, I mean, in your history that really were pushing or pointing the fingers, I mean, to these things and were saying these are important. So the very first one was Abraham Lincoln. I mean, in 1862, he promoted the Morrill Act, and uh, this was uh, really the beginning of, uh, was a consequence of a political movement uh, calling for the creation of higher education of agricultural colleges in that case. And it was a, really a major boost, that act, to higher education in America. And then one year later, under his presidency, the National Academy of Science was established, which is charged with providing independent, objective advice to the nation on matters related to science and technology. Science and technology are difficult areas. I mean, you cannot have politicians deciding, I mean, whether, you know, the gravity exists uh, or what? No, I mean, this is science and the scientists, you know, or about global climate. I mean, it's not, you don't vote on global climate, okay? As you don't, you cannot uh, vote on, uh, again, I mean, many of the other things. I mean, it's the science that is telling you, I mean, how things are. And then, of course, politicians can and should take decisions, but, you know, we should react. I mean, if those decisions are, are uh, made on, on the basis of a manipulation of misinterpretation of the data of the science. You know, and, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, not only Abraham Lincoln, but you know, your uh, uh, history is uh, disseminated of presidents that one after the other, I would say with only a few interruptions, uh, one after the other were really pushing for what? For this. You know, look at these words. You know, I'm still dreaming about the possibility of having a prime minister in Italy able to pronounce at least half of these words. <laughs> you know? In all the science, we've got to make sure that we are supporting the ideas that are not subject to politics that we are not skewed by an agenda. 
I will keep working to make sure that our scientific research does not fall victim to political maneuvers. You know, uh, these are, again, uh, uh, very important words from uh, uh, your past president. And uh, we, as scientists, uh, are the first ones that have to refuse the fight against any political interference that would damage the freedom of science. The freedom of science, not for the scientist, is in order for the citizen to receive the information, the data, and the evidence about the things that surround us. And it shouldn't be very difficult, right, to defend uh, the freedom of science for scientists because uh, uh, although we do not swear on a constitution or in court, the scientist is bound by a silent but not negotiable commitment to always say the truth and report the facts. So this to me is the very simple role of scientists. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, as a scientist working in, Ita in Italy, I had a number of little experiences that have taught me that it is not always like that. And, uh, and in many cases, I uh, really had uh, the personal feeling of what it means when a freedom is taken away from you and scientists around you just remain silent or are partners in crime. When this happens, democracy is a danger and the youngest will leave. So freedom comes with an infinite amount of responsibilities. And uh, every morning when I walk into my lab, uh, I feel an infinite amount of responsibilities. Detailed decisions which must be made uh, one after the other. You know, scientists is not, um, I mean, science is not just, you know, investigating things within labs. I mean, as I mean, you see here, I mean, we are here because uh, we want to work uh, together and, uh, and we want to be helpful to our societies. So at some point in my life, another strange thing happened. As uh, in uh, August 2013, about 7 p.m., so I think it was August 7 or 6, I got a phone call in the lab and uh, you know the person on the other side was telling me that the president of the Italian Republic, uh, Giorgio Napolitano, wanted to meet me. You know, it's like if your president would call you and say, I've never had any contact with him before, and say, okay, I want to see you. And of course, my first reaction was, uh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but then I went there, and of course, you can imagine how I spent uh, the days between the phone call and, uh, and the appointment. And I went there, and, uh, and he simply told me about his decision. So according to our constitution, the president of the republic can nominate up to five persons from the society uh, for special merits, so nominate them as lifetime senators. And, uh, and of course, this came absolutely out of the blue. Okay, I, mean, I, I had no contact before, I have absolutely no political preparation, I'm just a scientist. And when we were there, so he told me about his decisions, and, uh, and he also told me about, you know, the other people that he wanted to nominate, and I mean, as you see there, I mean, those are very special people, and among them, he wanted to nominate a biologist. And uh, so this was really a shock. And he wanted to have an answer immediately. I mean, I couldn't go home and try to study what it means being a lifetime senator and so on and so forth. So I had to take a decision. And, uh, and of course, I said yes, because, uh, you know, I always felt that, uh, you know, there is this uh, social dimension, I mean, in science that is uh, really the key component. I mean, we do our studies for the people that are outside the lab, and he was, he was offering me the possibility, I mean, to, 
to bring those battles, I mean, not just in the public domain, but actually in the Italian parliament. And uh, you can imagine how many battles uh, now I'm, uh, I'm trying to bring to the parliament because, you know, Italy is a difficult country, although it's a beautiful country. So I was uh, nominated to get together with these uh, other outstanding professional uh, people. And I, since then, I had the chance to understand more about the good and bad of the relationship between science and politics. And, um, and uh, three years later, I started a book I would have never imagined in my life to write a book. It's in Italian. And, uh, you know, when you think at the politicians, especially at least in my country, you, know, you put all the blame on them. Uh, you know, there is no interest in science in my country, there is no interest in the research, people live, and it's just a miracle, I mean, what Italy can do. It's a miracle, of course, supported also by, you know, funds that we can uh, uh, win, I mean, through open competition in the world and also through open competition with colleagues here in the States. And... Uh, so originally, my hypothesis was that the cause of the difficult relationship between politics and uh, science had to be put on the shoulder of the first one, of the politicians. But, you know, I was wrong. And, uh, you know, this... Uh, so there, there are, uh, you know... I, I really believe that, uh, you know, scientists should, uh, you know, think at their... Uh, activity and their role more profoundly because uh, what they are doing is really important. And uh, so there are scientists that simply don't fight for the freedom of research, but they build their privilege by obeying to political needs. You are facing this risk also now, okay, with uh, the current situation, political situation that you have here. I believe, at least this is my opinion. And, uh, of course, I mean, these scientists, at least in Italy, they are uh, well compensated for that. And uh, so, yes, freedom comes with responsibilities that cannot be betrayed. Uh, and, uh, and the role of scientists, as I mentioned, is really to act as sentinels and to serve the society by delivering the results of their investigation exactly as they are discovered. They just have to report the facts in an honest and transparent manner, irrespective, absolutely irrespective of whether they will please or displease any given body. Intellectual and scientists should not be on the payroll of anyone. And this is the only way, I mean, to be really a resource for citizens and institutions. So, Freedom, responsibilities, and as a consequence, hope. And uh, there is no hope if there is no freedom. And if we are not able to take our own responsibilities, and uh, if you search well, you will discover what it means really to work in order to give other people hope. And in the lab, we study Huntington disease since many years. And, uh, you know, it was described for the first time many years ago. And at some point in the history of Huntington disease research, uh, there, there was uh, this uh, very influential paper. So here we are in 1916. And this is the first paper that puts together the word Huntington together with the word eugenics. And uh, it was the beginning uh, of, uh, I think, a tragic direction for human beings, for the HD community. And uh, it, it, uh, so we, he was uh, proposing sterilization for people with Huntington disease. And uh, we know that in uh, some countries, like in Germany, Many people, thousands of people with Huntington disease were sterilized under the Nazi law for the prevention of a genetically diseased offspring. So Huntington was listed among the nine. 
for which uh, there was a, the request of uh, sterilization and uh, later on an unknown number of uh, persons with Huntington disease along with other psychiatric patients and persons with disabilities were murdered in Germany during the Third Reich. So this is a message for us. It tells us that uh, in the absence of knowledge, human beings can go into tragic directions and be very harmful to other human beings. This is why we need science. And uh, at some point, science brought some light, as you know, and this is Nancy Wexler. And uh, Nancy became aware of a village on the edge of uh, Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela with an extremely high incidence of Huntington disease. You know, I studied Huntington disease after having met her when I was a postdoc at MIT. And uh, you know her story. Now she organized an HD research community. I, d I didn't know, I mean, how do, you, how do you start a community of scientists working together on a single disease? How do you do that? Well, I think, I think it was her enthusiasm and the passion and love, I mean, they started all of this. And of course, the greatness of uh, the scientists that she was able to put together and their uh, amazing ability, I mean, to really work in an unknown territory and in difficult conditions, because you can imagine going to Venezuela many years ago, and probably also now, was not very easy. Anyway, they went there and uh, close to the Lake Maracaibo, there are these uh, little villages with very high incidence. And, uh, and this is a picture that I uh, found of the group. And this is Nancy, uh, this is Mercy McDonald. Uh, I, this is Jill Bates, Be behind here I don't see very well, but it should be Jim Guzella and uh, many other colleagues, and they found the gene. Without them, without science, without the scientists, we wouldn't have been able to find the gene. You cannot discover the gene through uh, political uh, legislation. I mean, you really need scientists. And uh, these people from Venezuela and Colombia, and you know, these people from Latin America, Really, they donated their blood, I mean, in those years, because they trusted the science and the scientists. And, you know, we all feel very grateful to them because we were able to find the gene because of their blood. And we paid, we paid a tribute to them. And uh, this happened this year. And we felt it was uh, about time, I mean, to... to recognize their contribution. You know, we have plenty of advantages as a consequence of that discovery. We have a genetic test, we have the recognition of the disease, we have treatments you know, that now are uh, ongoing in our countries, in the United States, in Europe. You know, they have nothing back from uh, their participation. So they were there in Vatican, in the in, uh, Vatican City, in front of the Pope. They were sitting first row, together with another 300 people, family members, many of you, patients from all over the world, from uh, 26 uh, countries. And this is Charles Sabine addressing the Pope uh, with, uh, with his uh, speech. And uh, we were 2,000 embracing all people from the world with Huntington disease. And the Pope was um, just amazing. And um, I know very well how all of this uh, started. It started about uh, more than one year ago with, uh, through a discussion with uh, Nacho, who knows San Juan, with Charles Sabine, Claudia Perandones, 
and then many other friends and colleagues joined immediately, Louis Vetter and many other friends. And you know, the first letter, I found the first letter I sent to the Pope. And the first letter that I sent said, Dear Pope Francis, how can you write a letter? I mean, saying, Dear Pope Francis. No? <laughs> and the object was um, a request for a private audience for one Venezuelan patient on behalf of all patients from the world. You know what the reaction was? The reaction was, why only one? We want to embrace them all, okay? And his speech was just outstanding. He kept saying, you are precious. You should never feel alone. He did no more. He pronounced, I mean, this slogan, and he said, it shouldn't be a slogan. It should be a commitment. So we are here just to reinforce this commitment. That week in Rome, it is marked in my memory as uh, one of the mm, great week I have uh, ever had. <laughs> you know, together with all of you, there were and the other friends and family members from the world, we had 50 people coming from Latin America exactly from those villages, from Barranquitas, also from Colombia, from Medellin, some from Argentina, 50 people. I stayed with them for the whole week. We were hosted by the Passionist Convent in front of the Colosseum. And uh, we were having lunch and dinner together in the convent. We made good friends in the convent with the priest and they were really outstanding. And, uh, you know, it, it, in the beginning, it was not easy, I can tell you. When they landed at Fiumicino Airport, you know, I didn't know them personally. Of course, Nacho knew them, but I didn't know them. And, of course, it was a big community. We were there waiting for them. We were crying like hell, okay, you can imagine. No, and... Uh, they took the elevator, some of them took the elevator and I was with another group. I lost them, I lost them in the elevator. They didn't know what to do. They were going up and down without knowing. So I felt so close to them. So, and I realized, okay, now we are a group of people. Now we are a team. Okay, we start from the elevator. And you know, from the elevator, they were hosted in the Italian parliament. So the president of the Senate, for the first time ever, decided that, okay, he wanted to embrace these people, to embrace the disease, and to say a few words on behalf of the Italian institutions. So they were sitting there together with senators and uh, other politicians and uh, really telling their stories. And uh, this is another beautiful moment. So the week, I mean, we, not only we had the papal event, the week was disseminated of events because of course we wanted to create links and networks and to build in order for that day and that week to become just the beginning of a new era for Huntington disease in the world. So here we are at Caritas, and you see there also Jamie Levy. And, uh, and of course, I mean, uh, we, we had some discussion with Caritas International. Here we are in a hospital, a Catholic hospital in Rome, uh, because, and these are physicians also from the States, from Argentina, from Venezuela, from Australia, from New Zealand. Okay, we want to establish links. How can we help, I mean, the families and the HD communities in the world. Here we are at our convent, 
And this is a team, it's quite a large team. You know, in the morning as we were beginning the day, you know, moving the 50 people toward the bus was, you know, something very challenging also because, you know, they don't have watches and they don't care about time. No, so it's, uh, and then in the end, uh, yeah, we also realized that, yeah, time is important, but sometimes, okay, there are other things that are more important. So these are uh, li really our friends. We had fantastic tours in Rome. This is in a uh, bus tour with them. And, uh, and this is in uh, Piazza San Pietro, in Piazza di Spagna and having lots and lots of ice creams, I think 10 times a day. <laughs> and uh, so was it was Rome just Mergolo. In Milano, uh, and uh, I met Roberta, she's a friend. This is and a story. And I told her about this event, and uh, she was very moved. She wanted to be with us, but uh, she cannot. So a few this is in minutes in the convent. after we started the discussion, hello, uh, she said, I want to contribute. So she has a present for all of you. Os ha dado un regalo para todo, para todos vosotros. For each of you. Para cada uno de vosotros va a haber un regalo de esta señora. These are uh, 50 wallets. Son 50 carteritas. And uh, in each wallet, there is a message for you from Roberta. En cada una de estas carteras hay un mensaje para vosotros de Roberta. And she added for you, for each of you, 200 euros. Y dentro hay 200 euros para cada uno, para que. Para que podáis ir de compras, comprar algún souvenir para vosotros o para vuestros hermanos o los que no hayan venido, para tus gafas de sol. ¿eh? So this is uh, the message from Roberta. Do you want to read it? We have it also in Portuguese. <laughs> Con vosotros para guardar el recuerdo de esta experiencia inolvidable de Roberta. Some of them never had a wallet before. Uh, ah, it's dos millones, Venezuelan Bolivar. One for you, one for you, and one for your husband. Eh? And... Uh, Look at this uh, fantastic uh, lady. Uh, She's from Venezuela, from Barranquitas. Brazilian, uh, real, real, yeah? 680 real. It's 200 euro is 680 real. Spanish euro is a lot of money. Sí, 680 reales, ha dicho, pero yo no sé el cambio como está. Yeah. And uh, 3,400 Argentinian pesos. Claudia. And Colombia is uh, 640,000 Colombian pesos. This is where we were having lunch in the convent. He's from Colombia, he has three, Not three me, brothers. For Roberta. And uh, so Ro Roberta is... Uh, Ro Roberta is a very special person. <laughs> These are really beautiful people. Can you say that Roberta is a very special person? Yeah. Okay. Dilia is uh, from Medellin. She has uh, 11 kids, I think eight or nine with the disease. Yeah. Uh, 
This is for, from Roberta. So there is so much dignity and courage <laughs> in these people. Okay, so now we give this to you. Yeah, we will. Be, to anybody. Yes, give, because this is for uh, the Portuguese. Leave it here. First, the Spanish. Spanish. Spanish, Ernesto, this is for you. I want to, I want to give it to your kid. The colors are all the same. No? The colors are all I the same. I want to give this to them. Agnelli, this is for you. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. I think we need to hug each other. No, because... Um, Hugs can do a lot. And this is for your husband? Yeah. The story is not finished. So we are uh, working uh, together with many people in the world, uh, really, to change the life of these people. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, with this, we want to change the life of all HD patients. You can learn more about this uh, on the Hidden No More website or the Factor H website that uh, Nacho is running. I mean, we, we can really do a lot for, um, you know, for this disease. And uh, one thing that we can do, of course, is to increase our uh, level of uh, understanding of the disease so that uh, we can uh, uh, develop better cures. And you know that there are uh, outstanding labs in the world working on, uh, on understanding how exactly the mutant gene that you see there causes a Huntington disease. And we know that the mutant gene is caused by a triplet repeat expansion, so CAG, 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 above 36, uh, leads to the disease. But just keep in mind that all of us had the gene, so we all carry the gene in a normal version, which is the one up there. And the normal version of the gene has a number of CAG repeats below 35. So I have the normal gene, who knows, maybe with 20 CAG repeats. Luis has the normal gene with uh, 25 or anyone else here with 28. So below 35 is a normal range. And of course, I mean, we are scientists and uh, one thing that we really want to know, we want to know why we carry that gene. So what is the reason for carrying that gene? If it can be so dangerous when the number of CAG repeats go above 36. Okay, so it's just, I mean, we need to know. There is the need to know more, okay? That desert, okay, I have to be, I want to be able to explore any meaningful direction and understanding why we carry the gene, you know, it may give, it may give some new perspective on, on the disease. And uh, we also want to know why we carry that gene with different flavors. So I said, I can have 20 CAG repeats and we can have 25. Why aren't we all 26? No, I mean, all people that don't have the mutation. So why aren't we all equal in the number of CAG repeats? So we vary also in this audience are very different in terms of CAG repeats in our normal genes. So what is the reason? And you know, if you want to try to understand that, I mean, you are a scientist, so that is a question. Then what do you do, I mean, in order to try to address that question? Well, I realize that um, the greatness of science is that uh, not only it allows you to understand and investigate the things that uh, happen around us today, but, you know, through the scientific method, you can also understand and uh, investigate things that happened million years year ago. To discover, to discover that the gene that we all have 
and that uh, causes Huntington disease when the number of CGRPs goes above 36, was born more than 800 million years ago. Wow. So the gene that we all have was born in an amoeba. The name is there, Dictyostelium discodeum. It is a fantastic species. It's the first pluricellular organism that has appeared on Earth. During evolution, before Dicti, we call it Dicti. Before Dicti, there is another species, years before, is East. East is unicellular and doesn't have the gene. Dicti is pluricellular, so pluricellular is an organism with a lot of cells together. I am pluricellular, okay? Dicti is a pluricellular organism and it has the gene. It has the Huntington gene very similar to my gene. With one exception, there are no CAG repeats. So when the gene was born 800 million years ago, it was born innocent with no CAG repeats. And then, of course, you are a scientist and you want to know more. I mean, so what happened between Dicti and us? Because I told you, I mean, we carry the gene. So we started investigating the evolutionary tree. And uh, down here is Dicti, you see, down there is Dicti. And uh, Dicti has the gene with no CG repeats. Then the evolution, at some point, branches into two branches. On one side, on your left, is the protostom branch. The insects belong to protostoms. On the other side is the branch that gave rise to us, so the, the deuterostom branch, so two branches. So, and we know that, you know, we had the gene, and we had the gene with up to 35 CAG repeats when the disease is not present in the family. So what happened between Dicti and us? And we started investigating uh, different uh, species during evolution, so we look at the protostom branch, and we search from, for different uh, species and insects, and uh, we analyze the DNA of those insects, of those uh, uh, species. We found the gene, so the gene is there, but there are no CAG repeats, okay? So in that branch, there are no CAG repeats. So then we turn to the other branch, the uterostom branch, and uh, what we did, we went to the fish market and bought some sea urchin. Because sea urchin, which is of course very good, but is also the first species of the deuterostom branch to carry a very primitive nervous system. We went to the fish market, we bought some sea urchin, we look at the DNA of the sea urchin, we found the gene, we found the Huntington gene, and for the first time, we discover that C. urchin Huntington has two CAG repeats. For the first time, the CAG repeats have appeared in C. urchin, and the two CAG repeats in the Huntington, in the Huntington gene from C. urchin is located exactly where the CAG repeats are in my gene. Let's assume it was an experiment of evolution. You know, evolution does a lot of experiment with our DNA. And uh, so evolution tried to put some CAG repeats in, in that DNA, I mean, to see what happened. No? And of course, it, the result is important and positive, you know, that threat will not disappear during evolution. And, uh, you know, the two CAG repeats in a species that carries a, a very primitive ring of nervous system may mean a lot. It may suggest that maybe those CAG repeats have appeared for a good reason, maybe, I mean, to foster the development of a very primitive nervous system. Dicti has no neurons and no CAG repeats. You know, we are changing perspective. I mean, we are biologists. You know, so we want to know whether, so, I mean, what is the reason for carrying the CAG repeats? This is suggesting that there might be some good reason. But we have to continue the investigation because of course, I mean, I told you, I mean, if this tract is important, then evolution normally would maintain it and would not. So let's look at more 
uh, progressively more evolved the species. So this time we couldn't find any Amphioxus in the fish market nor in the uh, Naples Bay due to pollution. We had to come to Florida and catch some Amphioxus. And then we went to the beach and that with the DNA from Amphioxus fly back to Italy. Uh, this is what we normally do. And uh, I mean, to see whether the gene was there, of course the gene is there, how about the CAG repeats? They didn't disappear. The CAG repeat have remained there. I'm not going to show that to you, but between sea urchin and dicti, there is some change in the organization of the gene uh, uh, in the uh, letters just surrounding the CAG repeat. So something has changed as if, you know, evolution wanted to, you know, uh, uh, make sure that this CAG repeat uh, would not go away. And Amphioxus is more elaborated, the nervous system of Amphioxus is much more elaborated than the one from sea urchin. How about other species with a more developed, evolved nervous system? How about zebrafish? These are tiny fishes with a very elaborated and evolved nervous system. We uh, uh, look at the DNA, the gene is there, how about the CG repeats? Four. And then we look at uh, other species. How about mice? Seven. Rats have eight. Uh, sheep, 10. Elephants, 12. Dogs, 13, 14. Monkeys, about 15. We are going into more details. So this is an amazing story. Because, you know, nothing happens by chance uh, during uh, evolution, so there must be some important evolutionary meaning associated to the CAG repeats. We are used to look at the CAG repeat as, uh, you know, of course, associated to the disease. It is a tragedy. But you now this is the result of an evolutionary path. And, uh, you know, that chain of intruding letters which repeat themselves reaches out to us, a human, who have quite a few of them. And, you know, in the beginning it might, be, it might have been an error of evolution in searching, but these are, the errors are also opportunities. And there are more of those letters in the more recent species, and there must be a good reason, we think, why they behave that way. And, uh, of course, there is a question now that, as scientists, we can raise. Do they take part, perhaps, in developing more and more functional nervous systems? This is what the evolutionary study, this is what I show you. Of course, we want to have more data you know, uh, suggest, but there is an experiment that, uh, you know, in the lab, uh, not only we can have great imagination, but we can also test the imagination to see whether it is real or not. And then we can deliver the results to politicians. At least this is what I want to do every Wednesday when I go to the parliament. You know, I want to go there, enter the parliament, say, okay, this is a PCR. This is a Western blot. We have to start from here. This is my idea of being a senator. So of course, I have to explain what a Western blot and PCR is. But, you know, I'm for life. So I have another 50 years to go. So how can we test whether there is an important biological significance associated to these growing CAG repeats up to a certain level? You know, we work on stem cells and we can make neurons from stem cells. And you can imagine we can generate in the lab stem cells with the Huntington gene with zero CAG repeat. And then in another plate, have stem cells with the Huntington gene with two CAG repeats. And then four, seven, eight, 10, 12, and they say recapitulate, recapitulate in the evolutionary path of the gene in stem cells. And then we can ask the stem cells, okay, can we make neurons out of them? This is exactly the experiment that we are doing. And um, I can tell you that the more normal CAG we add to the gene, the more neurons we see. 
So just by changing the number of CAG repeats in the normal range, we are influencing the development of the nervous system in vitro from stem cells. It is a suggestion. It is not enough, but it is a suggestion uh, of a, uh, no, about a really a functional role of those CAG repeats. And then, of course, there is more. And the question is, uh, okay, let's, how about us? I mean, why are we variable? I mean, why, of course, I mean, maybe we carry the gene because this was evolutionarily important for the development of the nervous system. But now, I mean, why are we different in the number of CAG repeats we carry? And there are beautiful experiments done by other colleagues. And, uh, and what did they discover? Well, they discovered that uh, although it is true that we are, uh, uh, we, uh, our CAG repeats you know, ranges between 9 and 35, at least this is what I've studied, okay? That in the normal population, the CAG in the gene vary between 9 and 35. So some people have 9 some 20, some 25, but actually none of us is nine. And uh, in a survey of about 20,000 Italian DNA, we couldn't find a single one with nine CAG repeats, not with 10, no, no one with 11, one with 12. We are all pushed to our more CAG repeat in our gene. As it is as if uh, evolution is still uh, 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 now, I mean, it's still pushing toward, you know, having more CAG repeats in our gene to the point that, and this is from Michael Hayden, to the point that one person in 17 has a number of CAG repeats between 27 and 35. One person in 17, it means, let's suppose we have 1,000 here, but 50 of us or 60 of us here have a number, an antintin gene with these CAG repeats, which is, of course, in the normal range, but quite high. And then there is another uh, discovery, I mean, from another group in German, Germany, showing that, well, those of us that have more CAG repeats in the normal range also have more gray matter. Wow. I don't know if having more gray matter means more in intelligence or more social capacity or being more friendly or, you know, and, and I think these data need, you know, uh, uh, further confirmation, you know, but there is an incredible suggestion here. And uh, uh, the suggestion is, uh, you know, that uh, what we see today as a disease, and of course it is a genetic uh, disease that we need to win, we want to win, we want to develop therapies. But, you know, it might be the consequence of an evolutionary push. And if this is real, it might also mean that our, their patients maybe they are uh, really at the frontier of human development. So they really, this is an hypothesis, they are really, you know, <laughs> representing the more extensive, extensive attempt of evolution, you need to add more and more of those CAG repeats. And these people, they pay a big burden for all of us. So this is why, I mean, we really have to work hard on that. But I, I, really, I really think that if this story is real, I, I keep saying if it is real, because, you know, I'm, I mean, we really need to know more. Uh, but uh, uh, really what we see as a, you know, a genetic problem, you know, sometimes some friends with the HD mutation, they told me, I feel as if I am a mutant. No, instead, I mean, maybe these people, they are not a mutant. They are, uh, again, I mean, just uh, people that are uh, uh, really representing the more advanced uh, evolutionary uh, step. Today, our neurons cannot cope with too many. 
CAG repeats, about 36. It can, our brain cannot cope with that. But who knows, maybe in one million year or two million years, so the normal CAG repeats will be up to 40, and the brain and the performance and our capacity will be improved. So, you know, I, again, I don't know if this is real, but of course there's a, there's a huge hypothesis here, and of course what we have to do is to investigate this hypothesis. And I'm closing with this uh, uh, slide that I, I really like. So this is the uh, uh, wedding room uh, in uh, San Giorgio Castle in Mantova, Italy, and there is this beautiful painting on the roof with this uh, oculus that opens illusionistically on the sky. Well, uh, uh, this is really uh, telling us uh, that, uh, I mean, this uh, opening through the ceiling is, uh, to me, the, the vision of science, of uh, uh, what science uh, provides us, uh, which is what we can see today, which is the answer that uh, best fits the facts at any time, but it also tells us that science is uh, not just a list of facts, but a way to understand our ignorance while sharing the inspiration and hope for new ideas and new discoveries. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions? I think we hopefully have a couple microphones available that'll run around the room. So are there any questions for Elena? Do we have microphones? One? There's gotta be some questions. There's one. Here you go. Here's one. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and that was very inspiring. Uh, I'm curious on your stem cell research. I've read in the past that on uh, extended fasting, we see that in the body, the uh, stem cell actually will go and be programmed to do some healing in the body wherever it is needed. So I'm just curious in your own research if you've seen uh, how extended fasting relates to and maybe possibly assists in the repair of Huntington's related uh, in, uh, negative impact on the body. Thank you. Um. Yeah, you know, we are uh, dealing with brain diseases, okay? So repairing a brain uh, is very difficult. Now, uh, also because the brain is one of those organs uh, that doesn't repair itself normally. And probably this is a good thing because, uh, I mean, if there is a, a high and intense repairing capacity, it would probably mean that also that tissue would regenerate itself a lot, and regenerating our brain probably is not a good thing, or maybe in some cases, yes. I'm thinking some, you know, people, no? Uh, but uh, instead, I mean, if you think at the hematopoietic system, this is a tissue with a very high regenerative capacity, and the stem cells in the hematopoietic system are very powerful, extremely powerful, because those, that system is composed of eight different cell types that work a lot. They need to be replaced. They will not stay there forever, the same throughout our life. This would be dangerous because they have to do so much work that they would, dam they would risk damaging the DNA. So evolution, of course, I love evolution. Evolution has imposed this mechanism so that the tissues that have to do a lot of work will be basically regenerated through stem cell source, which is located in exactly in those tissues with a high regenerative capacity. So the hematopoietic system has a high regenerative capacity, has a very bright and powerful stem cell. Also the skin, you know that we regenerate our skin every few weeks. There is a, an epidermal stem cell in the skin. The brain, of course, is very important for as a, a, a memory information storage and so on and so forth. The regenerative capacity is very low. So, Dealing with stem cells and the brain is extremely difficult because, uh, I mean, it's not that we can reactivate 
some stem cell source. There are a few stem cells in the, in the brain, and they are actually very slow and sloppy. No. So one way, I mean, to deal with stem cells and, uh, and brain diseases is, uh, of course, through transplantation. So you start with stem cells in the dish, and the stem cells we are using and that are very powerful for brain repair are the human embryonic stem cells, the ones that come from the overexceeding blastocyst. And over the years, we have learned how to instruct them to become exactly the neurons that we want to replace in the brain. Colleagues working on Parkinson's disease are far ahead of anyone else. So, and there are outstanding colleagues in the US, Lawrence Studer, for example, they have developed protocols to turn the stem cells into authentic dopaminergic neurons, which are the ones that die in Parkinson's disease. And they've been able to show, uh, they've been able to show that uh, after transplantation, so you can imagine, you start from a stem cell that can become 250 different things, and you are able to push the cells exactly to become what you want, then you transplant those cells into the brain of PD animals, Parkinson's disease animals, and the amazing results, fantastic, this is 20 years work, okay? The results that they uh, uh, were able to show was that these neurons from stem cells not only they were able to survive, differentiate, produce the dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that the normal dopaminergic neurons that die in Parkinson's disease would produce. Uh, they were, these cells were also able to um, uh, lead to uh, functional recovery in the animals, and also they were able to show, and this was a result that we have been waiting for since decades, they were able to show that those neurons were able to reestablish uh, contacts with the endogenous cells from the animals, suggesting that it might be possible in the future to repair, to reconstruct circuitries, damaged circuitries, at least in Parkinson's disease. This is why I mentioned Parkinson's disease people in my presentation, because they are really doing so well. I, I really, we really need to follow their path. For Huntington disease, we are able to generate good neurons from stem cells. Several groups have been able to show that they can generate neurons that look like the striatal neurons that die in Huntington disease. There are some experiments. We are, let's say, 10 years behind the PD, the Parkinson disease group. There are experiments also in my lab, I mean, of uh, uh, transplanting, I mean, these neurons from the stem cells. We have to see, I mean, how it goes. Another option that uh, you uh, probably uh, were thinking was uh, reprogramming. Uh, no, instead of starting from the human embryonic stem cells, we could start from the fibroblast, my fibroblast, or the fibroblast from a Huntington disease person reprogram the, those fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells and then make the neurons from these cells. You, you see, it becomes, you know, it's a long path, but we can do also that. But in this case, if you want to transplant neurons from the fibroblast of an HD person, you would need to correct the gene first, because otherwise those neurons would carry the mutant gene and would probably, I mean, have some consequence later on, but let's say the stem cell field is really, you know, uh, in a continuous, I would say, turbulence, you no, know, with a lot of hype and hope, uh, the up and down, but uh, we have to select, I mean, the people uh, you know, that are doing a great stem cell work and just follow what they are doing, of course, I mean, with a lot of, uh, through a lot of collaborations. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I mean, I'm always too long. Yes, there is a question or a comment here? Comment. Uh, yes, yeah. There is. Uh, thank you indeed for that very uh, inspiring speech that you gave and the work that you and your colleagues have done. I think I, sh I share with everyone here uh, sort of the fascination of your hypothesis that this uh, Huntington's uh, excessive repeats could actually be an evolutionary uh, move by nature. And in those patients that you have uh, worked with and in your research and your colleagues, have you done any studies that correlate that at least from the experience of my wife's family, those who had onset later in life were all brilliant people. They were professors, they were artists, they were people that 
I looked up to and then tragically cut short. So I was wondering if there are any social studies that you're working on to see if there's a connection between those who have the gene can live long enough to at least have some form of life, but they were also extraordinarily intelligent, far more than I am, and I have just normal repeats. Any thoughts you have on that? You know, there is a, a colleague here. I, I'm not a clinician, I'm a biologist. I mean, I already have difficulties understanding cells in a dish. No, but there are great clinicians also, of course, here oh, in okay. the United States. And there is a colleague, Peggy Nopolos, from the University of Iowa. And uh, she's studying exactly that. So she's uh, trying to see whether there is any correlation between uh, CAG size, also in the normal range, and uh, IQ. And, uh, and um, you know, we're uh, uh, looking at um, kids uh, with uh, autism, you know, because they have some special trait as well. And um, there is something uh, with the CAG in the normal range. So um, I think, you know, science can reveal unexpected things. I think we are on the verge of really, I mean, probably understanding something quite amazing about this disease, not last. I know many persons with, with the mutant uh, gene which are just outstanding, I mean, in terms of their capacity. And, uh, and the Peggy actually, uh, um, I don't know if uh, she has published this, uh, but uh, she has presented this at the meeting. Uh, she has uh, tested uh, 80 kids who are uh, 12 years of age and have the mutation, so they are above 36, but they're very young, so they're far away from onset, versus another group of another 80 kids that do not have the mutation. And uh, if I remember well her presentation, she was saying that these kids with a lot of CG repeats, huh? when they are 12, they have a better, better visual skills and motor skills, up to 44 CG repeats. After 44, this advantage or better performance is lost. Nevertheless, I mean, this is another interesting uh, thing, I mean, to consider. Uh, so, but uh, I think we need to do more, and certainly we will join forces with many clinicians yeah, in the world. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, there is an, uh, sorry. Thank you. You're on the cutting edge of scientific research for HD. Do you believe that you'll see a cure in your lifetime for HD? Uh, can you, uh, because I cannot hear very well. You know, I am a scientist and I cannot answer the question. You have to turn to a magician. I don't want to be, uh, I mean, uh, to I mean, reply in a bad manner to you, but you know, scientists cannot answer this question. Now, what, what I can guarantee to you is that myself and any other scientist in this room and outside this room will do whatever they can, as much as possible. So we can guarantee that we will, that there will be no path that will remain unexplored. This for sure. Okay, but I think it would be unfair, I mean, to go beyond that. I work, nevertheless, I work for that to happen as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I think, I'm sorry, I think just to get everyone a break, Elena will stick around for a little bit. Can I ask my question? Um, for, yes, uh, because yes, yes. I've been waiting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, the relationship between evolution and the CAG is obvious, but the question, the one thought of mine is, one, whether you have been able to do, decide whether it's whether the CAG is uh, a result of evolution or the cause of evolution. The other is, what have you done to look at the other mammals, especially like the apes and that, to see 
what the, how much CAG is in other animals, and especially things like the whales. They have big, uh, very, very big brains as well. Thank you. You know, I have students that are going from zoo to zoo, <laughs> no, uh, uh, trying to, you know, convince snakes <laughs> to donate some of their, I don't know, blood or, uh, you know, there is no blood or uh, whatever. Yeah, we're uh, very much interested into that. And um, uh, we have a collaboration with a group in Japan. I mean, as we're very interested in monkeys, you know, monkeys, I mean, cover big chunk of uh, evolution. I don't have an answer yet, but who knows, maybe, maybe next year. Maybe the only thing, the anecdotal thing that I can tell you is just anecdotal. We have screened bats, you know, bats. Uh, and I didn't know that there are uh, two big classes of bats. There are uh, the mini bats. Mini bats are cute. No, they can stay on your... Uh, uh, hand, and the megabats. Megabats are really like this, with an alar uh, opening, no, like this. And uh, we happen to be able to study DNA from about uh, 20 minibats and 20 megabats. Of course, there are different species, but these are the two main classes. And, you know, and minibats, not only they are cute, but they are also extremely smart. And they have a very rich uh, diet, and, uh, and the other important thing is that they use uh, the echolocation no, uh, to, to hunt for uh, food. The megabats are quite stupid, and uh, the, they have very poor diet. Well, you look at their DNA, and you discover that the minibats have around 9 or 10 CAG, and the megabats are between 4 and 5. So it's just anecdotal, you know, but... Uh, well, I hope to have more very soon. Yeah. <laughs> One more round of applause for Dr. Catano.